Come on, let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise in the house. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. What a privileged opportunity to be back, to be home. I, I consider when I come to Bethel home. I just uh, thank you for all that you're doing. And uh, it's a delight. It's a delight to reconnect with my dear friend, John, Pastor John, Dr. John. But to me, it's friend John. We, each time we get together, we kind of go to the next level in friendship. Last November, I had the privilege of preaching a large conference in Nigeria, first time in Nigeria. Dr. John gets wind that I'm going and says, Pastor, I, I, I need to go with you. I, I, I need to go with you. There, I need to just, just trust me, I need to go with you. And I was so glad he went with me. When the car broke down on the side of the road, when we were different things, and so we had spent some ministry together. There was about 25,000 or more at this conference, and it was a large conference, and Pastor John was a gracious host, and um, I was preaching on uh, the power of the Spirit to the next generation, to the next generation. And they had a worship team, not, not, not quite like Milk and Honey, but almost, almost, not quite, not quite, but almost. And so they got going in some worship, and I saw, I saw all these students and these 20-some-year-olds, and, and I'm on the platform with all these dignitaries, just kind of the only white guy in the house, just sort of clapping like that. So I looked at John. I've got some youth ministry in my day. I said, John, let's go. Let's go. So we got down, and we, we got down in the front, and we just kind of got our little Pentecostal swag going a little bit. The students broke through the security line, and I think we had the first mosh pit in the Nigeria Assemblies of God history. And the closer, the closer that they got in and the enthusiasm, when I saw John make a beeline for the stage, I made a beeline for the stage, and uh, it was a delight. Just, uh, I'm honored, honored today uh, to be here. I'm also honored today to do something I only do once a year as the Assemblies of God superintendent, and that's to... Um, pronounce a declaration and an award, and today it's with great honor that I pronounce to Bethel Covenant Assembly of God the Premier Church of Influence Award for 2020. Hallelujah! Of all the 13,000 churches, you today are being declared as the Premier church of influence the lord be praised you say what's a church of influence a church of influence is recognized for the impact and influence they have in their community for the impact and the influence that they're having in the nation for the impact and the influence that they're having in the world so on this day september 20 in the year of our lord 2020 General Superintendent, I hereby declare Bethel Covenant Assembly of God as the recipient of the Premier Church of Influence. Can you clap your hands unto the Lord? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. God bless you. We thank you for the example you are to churches not only in this community but around the world and you know what's really exciting the best is yet to come there is no doubt in my mind I, when we toured the facility out there on the from the moment we walked into the little fellowship hall till we got over to the sanctuary the kids hall the office the i had goosebumps i literally had goosebumps up and down my arm and we stopped and we prayed. We prayed where the stage is going to be. We prayed where the weddings are going to take place. We prayed at the altar. We took some anointing oil, just marked at the altar, salvations, deliverances, and healings. And so I, I, I got to tell you, it's with anticipation and excitement that the best days are yet ahead. God bless you. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. You may be seated. I want to bring a message to you from the book of Joshua entitled, Here to There, A New Way for a New Day. 
Is anybody else in this room a little bit COVID-19 fatigued? <laughs> you know, we've kind of gone through it all. We had a visible plague that sheltered us in. Then we experienced some invisible plagues that uh, brought us out. I was telling pastor last night, I, I wasn't given a manual in seminary. <laughs> Monty, I don't know if you're going to develop, but I wasn't given a manual in seminary on how to lead a church through a pandemic or how to respond to communities that are rising with tension because of race relations. But I do know this. I haven't heard a trumpet sound yet. And until the Lord delays his returning, I believe God has a purpose for his church. And just because services were canceled doesn't mean church was canceled. And you are a living example of that. And so I thank you. I want to recognize and welcome those who are watching online, those who are in the overflow. I want to draw some lessons from the life of the children of Israel who were kind of in a unique spot. They were entering into a new way of living. They were entering into some new customs. They were entering into just a new way of doing things. And, and they were okay with it because Moses, their leader, had been, had, had been their security for about 40 years. But in Joshua chapter 1, right off the bat, we discover that Moses, my servant, is dead. So they initiate a succession plan. Joshua steps into place. And all of a sudden now he's got to lead this these, these children, he's got to lead this people group into this new way of living in a new day, minus Moses. Now, Moses was a beloved leader. He, he talked to people, uh, or he talked to God about his people. He, he provided a sense of confidence. And what I want to do today is give you six guiding principles of how Joshua and what the Lord and Joshua did to help the children of Israel step into a new way of living in a new set of circumstances. And then I want to leave you with three commitments that I believe, three um, just declarations that I believe God has for this church as you're about to leave this location and move into your new location. The first guiding principle that I see that the children of Israel and Joshua had to, accept, had to identify was this. They had to accept the reality. They had to accept reality. Joshua chapter 1 verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. The one that they had so much confidence in, the one who, uh, who they leaned in on when things got tough was now gone. And I would submit to you that facing reality, accepting reality, is one of the first steps towards moving on. You see, one of the things you have to do in accepting reality is you've got to guard against denial. Not just death, but employment, relationships, transitions, a disease, whether you think it's real, not real, fabricated, not fabricated, politicized, not politicized. If you're not careful, you can, go, you, you, you can deny things and not accept reality and not get to the place where God wants you to go. Secondly, you've got to fight against doubt. You see, our minds play tricks on us, especially when we go through unexpected and unanticipated adventures. But I want you to know God will never leave us. God will let us, never let us have to handle situations on our own. A.W. Tozer says, and I quote, We cannot think rightly of God until we begin to think of him as always being there and there first. God said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I shall be with you. Listen, the Spanish flu hit, shut down churches, shut down businesses, shut down men. God was with his people. The Great Depression came and hit. Businesses closed. People, uh, 401ks, retirements were, were eroded. But God was with his people. In the 60s, when our streets were filled with race riots, God was with his people. I'm here to tell you today, as I was with Moses, God says he will be with you. And part of walking into living a new way, ministering a new way, functioning as a new way, is we've got to accept reality. 
You see, life is rarely what we prefer it to be. I mean, you think about it. We prefer life to be have no surprises. How many of you know life is full of surprises? We prefer life to have no adversity. Life is full of adversity. We prefer life to have no pain, but life is full of pain. And I'm telling you, if you're having a hard time accepting the reality of where we're at today, I want to remind you, first of all, that God's grace is sufficient. The Bible says in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. If you're having a hard time accepting reality, I want you to know that God's peace is relevant. The Paul said in 2 Thessalonians, that the Lord of peace himself will give you peace at all times and in every situation. If you're having a hard time accepting reality, you can go to the bank on the fact that God's strength is amazing. Isaiah said in Isaiah 41 verse 10, do not be afraid for I am your God. Do not be discouraged for I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. If you're having a hard time accepting reality, you got to remember that God's presence is comforting. You make known to me, Psalm 1611 says, the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence. You don't have to ignore reality. You don't have to deny reality. You don't have to pretend it doesn't exist. But you look squarely in the face of your realities and you declare that you serve a God whose name is Shal Shaddai, the God of plenty, the all-sufficient one. Accept reality. Secondly, you got to keep moving. You just have to keep moving. Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead, period. Now then, comma, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan. Hey, say that with me. Get ready. Come on, say it again. Get ready. That kind of feels like T.D. Jakes right there. Get ready. Get ready. I've always wanted to do that. I've never had an opportunity to do that. I just kind of did that. Get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give. You know, I believe God was encouraging the people here not to get stuck in their mourning. Their, their M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. They had mourned for 30 days. How many of you know you'll never get where God wants you to go if you spend all of your time in self-pity, wallowing in your self-disappointment? Just because the man of God died doesn't mean that God was dead. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, get going. Get ready. Cross the Jordan. Sometimes in reality, church, you have got to remind yourself that our steps really are ordered up by the Lord. Sometimes in the realities of life, you got to remind yourself that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Sometimes in the realities of life, you got to remember that he who began a good work in you will continue it until it is finally finished. Sometimes in the realities of life, when you got to remind yourself that when you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. When you go through the flood, you will not be drowned. For God is your refuge and God is your strength and God is an ever-present help in time of trouble. Hallelujah. You got to keep moving. And in your moving, you got to let your God talk be louder than your self talk. You say, what's the difference? Self talk says something like this. I can't handle this. God talk says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Self talk says, I don't know what to do. God talks, says, if you lack wisdom, you can ask it of God, who gives it to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Self talk says, I'm afraid. God talks, says, I haven't given to you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Self talk says, where is God in all of this? God talks, says, nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. 
no height, nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things can come. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Come on, church, you got to just keep moving. You got to keep moving. You got to let your God talk be louder than yourself talk. You say, why is moving so important? Because miracles come in the motion of moving. Miracles come to people who move. Very rarely do miracles hit people who are on the, on the sidelines. Very rarely do miracles come to people who are, who are bystanders. You think about it. The parting of the Red Sea, the sea parted when they moved and stepped into it. The feeding of the 5,000, the disciples, as they were passing out the food. God didn't fill their baskets ahead of time. He kept their baskets filled as they continued to move. The wedding of Canaan, as they continued to distribute the wine that was turned from water into wine, was there because they were serving, they were doing, they were this. Some of you will step into your possibility if you'll just keep moving. You will step into your possibility if you keep moving. But if you wallow in your mourning, if you wallow in your self-pity, if you allow yourself to listen to all of the social media and news broadcasts about the realities of life, you're going to get stuck in your morning. And the Bible says, now then, Moses, my servant is dead, period. New thought. Get up. Get ready. Because I'm about to take you into the land that I promised. Somebody say, keep moving. Say it again. Keep moving. Thirdly, don't fear. Don't fear. Or in other words, don't be overcome by fear. Look at verse 5, chapter 1. No one will be able to stand against you for all the days of your life. For as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You know, in times of uncertainty, your greatest enemy is fear. That's why early on in this COVID outbreak and in the cancellation of some of our services, I felt like the Lord gave me a word and a scripture. And the word was this, Doug, you need to help our churches learn to starve their fear and feed their faith. And the verse that the Lord gave me was Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, that's verse 6, that says, we can say with confidence, the Lord is our helper. We can say with confidence. Listen, fear does crazy thing to us. Fear by its nature, if we let it, takes over and, 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 and we get fear of, uh, of obstacles. We get fear of people. We get fear of faith, failure. We even become fearful of the future. Can I tell you, fear of the future is not of God. And I'm not just trying to say something uh, preachy and then move on. Fear of the future is not of God. You know why? Because God is already in our future. And if God is already in your future, you don't have to fear the future. You just have to look to him to lead you into the future. Don't get overcome with fear. Now, it's not wrong to fear because there's a lot of fearful things. What's next? Every time I see something come up on my phone about the governor coming out with a new statement, I'm like, oh, no, what's next? What's next? We're living in days where every week we're wondering what's next. So it's not wrong to fear, but you allow the Holy Spirit to keep you from being overcome by fear and letting the consequences of fear be stronger than the reality of the strength of God. The fourth guiding principle that I see that led the children of Israel and Joshua in this living a new way in a new day is that they had to be strong and courageous. Be strong and and courageous. Say that with me. Be strong and courageous. Joshua 1.6, be strong and courageous because you're going to lead these people to inherit the land I swore. Verse 7, be strong and very courageous. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Verse 18, only be strong and courageous. Do you think God's trying to get a point across here? <laughs> be strong, be courageous. Time doesn't permit me this morning to totally unpack this, but I would submit to you that strength is a matter of character and courage is a matter of responsibility. And we need both. 
We need both character and we need both responsibility. And in our journey, on this walk, in this, in this season of life where, where not only do we not know what ne- next week holds, but we do find ourselves in some long-term delays. In fact, can I ask you, have you ever been in a hurry when God wasn't? And oftentimes in those delays, we lose our strength, we lose our courage, and we become impatient, and we thwart the purposes of God being accomplished not only in our life, but through our lives because we get impatient. Can I tell you that part of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life is to help you become strong and courageous? I love the Holy Spirit. I love my relationship with the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit does, helps me do a lot more things than just speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit does a lot more for me than just help me give prophetic words. Let me remind you of a few things that the Holy Spirit can do if you'll let him. Number one, the Holy Spirit will help make known to you the mind of God. John 16, 50. The Holy Spirit will produce for you spiritual vitality in your life. Titus 3, 5 and 6. The Holy Spirit can assure you of your salvation. Romans 8, 16. The Holy Spirit can give you power over your sinful nature and over sinful habits. Galatians 5. The Holy Spirit can can counsel you and guide you according to John 16, 13. And the Holy Spirit can help you in your weakness according to Romans 5, 28. So come on, don't just be Pentecostal in name only. Be Pentecostal in lifestyle. Develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit where he provides for you strength and courage and contentment even if the circumstances you're living in are not content. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Be strong. Be courageous. And you don't have to do that on your own. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. There's a fifth guiding principle that's so powerful. Doing new things, new ways in these new days, I'm going to encourage your church. You're going to have to learn to stay in the book. You're going to have to learn to stay in the book. Look at verse 8. God says, keep this book of the law always on your lips, Joshua 1.8. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Now watch this. Then you will be prosperous and successful. This is not just some pep talk. This is a serious life and death speech to a group of people who are in a new reality. We're in a new reality. It's not like it was in February of this year. And I think what Joshua is talking about, God is speaking here, is he's reminding the children of Israel the power of the word of God. He says, I want you to keep it in two places. I want you to keep it in your mouth and I want you to keep it on your mind. He says, I don't you to only know the scriptures. I want you to speak the scripture. Keep the word or the book of the law always on your lips. And then he goes on to say, I want you to think about the law. I want you to meditate on it day and night. I want you to do what David said in Psalm 119.97. Uh, how, how I love your law. I meditate on it day and night. Listen to me, Bethel. God did not give us his word to make us smarter sinners. He gave us the book so that we could live overcoming and transformational lives. See, Pastor Clay, do you really believe that? Yes. I believe not only does the Word of God anchor your emotions and protect your thinking when you're waiting on God or when you've been interrupted because of life circumstances or when you go through one of those why is this happening to me type times. So not only do I believe the Word will anchor our emotions and protect our thinking, But here's why I've discovered that the word of God, when used correctly, is incredibly transformational. But when the word of God is used incorrectly, it's very destructive. That's why this church places such a high priority on scripture. That's why Pastor John 
preaches the word, teaches the word, prophesies the word, because the word of God, the word of God when used correctly is powerful, but when used incorrectly, and in days of uncertainty, even in a Pentecostal movement, there are some people who use the word of God incorrectly. There are some people who say, well, if you're of real mature faith, then you'll never have any problems or issues. That's baloney. How many of you know it rains on the just and the unjust? Sickness comes to Christians and non-Christians. COVID hits people of the faith and people outside of the faith. So I think it's important in these days that we're using the Word of God correctly. Because I had an experience where the Word of God was used incorrectly, and it almost derailed me of my faith. I've shared my testimony here at the church before, but I'm a preacher's kid. I'm a third-generation Pentecostal preacher's kid. My mom was the minister of music. My dad was the pastor. Man, I loved the church. I, 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 I loved everything about the church. I, many, I cut my teeth in the back of church pews. Um, I fell asleep many Sunday nights in the church. <laughs> In fact, I was left sleeping in the pew many Sunday nights in the church. Mom thought dad was going to take me home. Dad thought mom was going to take me home. Can I tell you, you can sing all you want, raise a hallelujah, but when the lights are out and you fall asleep and you're the only one in a church pew, it's a spooky place to wake up, I'm just telling you. I love the church. I knew which Sunday school teacher served the best snacks, so if the altar call was going too long, I would find that supply closet and chow down on all those snacks. Nine years old, my dad died suddenly of a massive heart attack. I was nine, my brother was 15, my sister was 18. But I never felt the negative impact of being raised by a single mom for a couple of reasons. Number one, I was a part of a great church like Bethel, where I had a lot of spiritual dads. I had guys like Ralph that took an interest in me as a young boy at Royal Rangers and helped me build my Pinewood Derby car. There were elders like Brother Elder Jones that every Sunday night would come and just put their hand on me. And, oh, God, I pray for Dougie Clay. So honestly, I had spiritual dads. The other thing is our pastor, who was the youth pastor at the time, voted in to replace my dad. Was a 21-year-old youth pastor, young, didn't have any children. So it sort of took me under his wing. I'll never forget one of the favorite things I like to do with Brother Leach was that whenever we'd have a guest come into town, we would go out to eat. And if it, was, if, if it was a friend of his from college, we'd always go home and Sister Leach would, would make sandwiches and play games. If it's somebody he didn't really know, we would go to Pizza Hut because it was quick. You could go in and get it out. But if it, was a, if it was a big guy, if it was a big name, if it was a powerful person, if it was a Pastor John type personality, then we always went to Frisch's Big Boy. So I'll never forget, six months after Brother Leach was the pastor, my dad had passed away, um, a very high profile evangelist came to town. He preached kind of this prosperity type gospel and message and, and uh, he had the entourage. He had his worship team. He had the people that worked the book table and he just kind of had that look of a high profile evangelist who preached uh, extra prosperity type of a gospel. Sunday night, we were out at church and Brother Leach took me, so I'm there playing on my placemat, the dot-to-dot -dot game, the tic-tac-toe, and all of a sudden I heard this evangelist say, well, pastor, the reason why your predecessor died at an early age, there either must have been sin in his life or it was a lack of his wife's faith. And I turned and I kind of looked. And like only a godly shepherd could do, Pastor Leach quickly changed the conversation, brought it to a halt. We paid and as we were leaving, Pastor Leach says, Duggar, I want you to ride home with me. He had a Chevy Impala, and in that, they had bench seats. Back in those days, you didn't care much about seat belts, so he put the armrest down. He says, I want you to sit on this armrest right here. And for about a 15-minute ride home, his arm was around me, and he said, no, I know you heard something tonight, and what you heard is not biblical truth. And he began to unpack for me that our life and our times are in God's hands, that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that judgment, and totally unhitched me 
from being confused by how someone was interpreting the word of God incorrectly. So here's what I'd say to you, church. You have a wonderful opportunity to declare the whole counsel of God in the city of San Antonio. You have a wonderful opportunity to let people discover the life change that comes from the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The sixth guiding principle for the uh, children of Israel was that they just expected that God would come through. They took God at his word. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go, verse 9 says. Don't be afraid. Don't be. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So we bring this message to a close. Those are the six guiding principles. But I also wanted to give you three new practices that I believe this God wants this church to observe as you walk into some of your new days and your new ways. You got to go up to Joshua chapter 3 because Joshua chapter 1 is all about the succession. It's all about Moses dying. They crossed the Red Sea. They're now in there. But now when you get into Joshua 3, his leadership has been established and the, Israel, uh, the Israelites find themselves in this, this new day, having to get, get, develop things and do things in a new way. And I notice three new practices. Number one, there was a new commitment. There was a new commitment. Listen, every new season requires a new level of commitment. Yesterday when we were walking through the building, I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, challenge the people tomorrow to not rest on their laurels when they come into this building, but roll up their sleeves and say, God, what's next in the, in the area of growth and development that you're having for us? You see, it'll be very easy to, to get into that setback and, ah. Oh, but I want to challenge you to develop a spirit of Joshua and Caleb and say, roll up your sleeves and say, God, give, give us this hill country. Give us this territory. Give us this land. Give us one more soul for you. Secondly, there's the practice of identifying new complications. Grandpa and Grandma had, part, had, had walked across the Red Sea. They experienced the miracle of the Red Sea. But now here in Joshua 3, the next generation was, was experiencing a new complication. They were supposed to cross the Jordan, but the Jordan was overflowed. The, the, it, the Bible says it literally had overflowed the banks. There's so many teaching parts. This. How many of you know every generation needs their own Pentecost? But here's what I catch from the scripture. The, script, the, the word of the Lord tells the priest, go down there and put your feet. Again, there's that, there's that element of motion. Go down and put your feet. And when your feet enter into the Jordan, that's when God's going to perform the miracle. Here's what I'll suggest to you. What is inside of you is stronger than the obstacles that will be before you. And don't forget that. Just because you're getting into a bigger building with greater assets doesn't mean there's not going to be greater complication. Because at every level, there's a new devil. But I also know at every level, with a new commitment and a new consecration and a new commitment to the power of the Spirit, you can face that. So my prayer for this church is that you'll continue to practice new commitments, especially when you face your new complications. You'll remember that the strength inside of you, the spirit inside of you is greater than what's in front of you. But ultimately, all of you, whether you're a brand new Christian or you're a seasoned elder, we will develop new consecration. New consecration. You got to go up to Joshua 5. Because in Joshua 5, Joshua challenges for all of the leaders to become circumcised at Gilgal. You see, circumcision was a marked sign for covenant blessing. And Joshua said, you know, some of you came through the wilderness and didn't get circumcised. Some of you were, but I believe there needs to be a new marked sign of consecration. 
And so my prayer is that as you enter into that building, as much as you've prayed, as much as you've fasted, as much as you've given, as much as you don't stop doing that just because you come into the destiny of a new building. You continue that for the glory and the honor of God. Thank you, Bethel, for being such a healthy, life-giving church. You know, I can't imagine going through what we've gone through these last eight months without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's one thing to try to steward it, being a follower of Jesus, but to live with an uncertainty that you belong to him. So today, if you're here, you're watching online, you're in the overflow, or you're in this building, and you have never come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for certain if you were to die, you would spend eternity in heaven. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I don't live with the guy. I, I live with guilt. I get beat up by guilt. I love the feeling that I feel when I come to church here, but generally by Wednesday, I'm, I'm living underneath the guilt. I want you to know you don't have to do that. You can live with the full assurance and the full confidence that you belong to him and that he belongs to you. But it goes beyond just belonging to the church. You got to belong to Jesus. So I want you to bow your heads with me. If you're here this morning, watching online or in this room, and you'd say, Pastor Clay, please include me in your final prayer. I do not live with the complete confidence that if I were to die today, I'd spend eternity in heaven. I don't live with that, that assurance that I'm his and he's mine. But, but you know what? Today, I want to. Today, I want to know that I know that I know I belong to the Lord. If that describes you, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to have you come forward. I simply want to pray with you. So while everybody else is heads bowed, eyes closed, if you would like me to include you in my final prayer, just raise your hand and look at me because I want you to know. Yes, thank you. Thank you. God bless you guys. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, young person. Thank you. Several hands saying, I got to know that I know that I know that my past is forgiven. My present is secure because Jesus is with me and that he'll help me script a new future. Maybe you're online and you're wanting to pray this prayer, I'm going to invite you to do it. In fact, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask all of the church to stand with me. If you're here inside or you're in the overflow, would you just stand? I want you to stand. And I want to pray a simple prayer, a simple prayer that acknowledges that Jesus is our Savior, we're a sinner, and that He and He alone can forgive us of our sins. It's a prayer that many of us have prayed in times past, but today, today we're praying it for several people who are saying, you know what? I want to know that I know that I belong to him. So Bethel Church, would you repeat this prayer after me right now? Lord Jesus, I do believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, who came from heaven to earth to die for my sins. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. Come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and establish yourself as my Savior and my Lord. So today, I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart that you are the way, the truth, and the life. I accept this free gift of eternal life in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together if you prayed that prayer. Congratulations. God bless you, Reverend. Stretch your hands to us, Reverend Dr. Doc Clay, that just blessed us with the word of God.